Some of my favorite viral online stories are those involving unlikely heroes. You know, stories of pizza delivery drivers rescuing children from a burning building. Or how about the time a short order cook rescued three girls when he was on his way home from McDonald's and became a viral hero because of it. Many folks of humble origin have captured the hearts of the internet over the years, and today I'll be telling the stories of some of these unlikely heroes. From a camera technician credited for catching a dangerous wanted criminal, to a Waffle House customer stopping a mass shooting, to a Santa Claus actor helping a terminally ill child, these are the internet's unlikely heroes. Today's video is sponsored by Proton. Look, I know a lot of you guys out there use VPNs, you think you're all safe and secure browsing the internet, but dog, have you checked your email lately? You may not realize it, but your email is very likely a personal information leaking nightmare. And you can bet your bottom dollar that this information is being leaked to advertisers. We're talking about information like your full name, home address, medical documents, billing information, and even stuff like passports. Dude, it's time to stop accidentally sharing everything about yourself with your email provider and get linked up with Proton Mail. Proton Mail protects your emails with end-to-end -end encryption, so no one, not even Proton, can see your emails. Proton also blocks marketing trackers and malware, so nobody knows if you've opened their emails that they send. This helps discourage spam, phishing attacks, and spoof links being sent to you. Proton is based in Switzerland, so you're protected by robust privacy laws. Be one of 100 million users that have already chosen privacy. To get started for free, click the link in the description. That's proton.me slash wavy. Every Christmas season, tens of thousands of bearded portly gentlemen suit up to portray the sacred role of Santa Claus. Be it mall Santas or those who work private events, these jolly fellows are a welcome sight by all. While most of the work as a Santa Claus actor involves you spending time with children in some of their happiest holiday moments, the Santa featured in this tale became an internet hero for helping a child at their lowest moment. This is the story of the East Tennessee Santa, Eric Schmidt Matson. They'll let you in for, I'm sure they'll let you right in. He goes, they will? I says, I know it. He just came up and gave me a big hug. Eric Schmidt Matson from Carryville, Tennessee, was 61 years old at the time of this story unfolding in 2016. This portly bearded gentleman had been working as a Santa Claus actor for six years at this point, and he was damn good at his job. Eric was renowned for his jolliness and the meticulous detail that he put into his look. In fact, Eric once won a Best Stylized Mustache and Natural Beard Award in July of 2016, winning this after competing in the National Mustache and Beard Championship. Yes, it is a thing. A tireless servant to the spirit of Christmas, Eric Schmidt Matson has been described as always on by his peers. A guy that never shies away from the opportunity to portray Santa Claus even when he's off the clock. As a result of the man's looks, even when he's out of costume, children often approach him while he's out in public or at restaurants eating dinner. They come up to talk to him about their Christmas lists and other Yuletide dealings and He's always down to put a smile on their face. All things considered, Eric Schmidt Matson is a guy that loves his line of work. However, the job isn't without its sad moments. And one of these depressing holiday vignettes would turn into a public spectacle, a bittersweet Christmas tearjerker that transformed Eric Schmidt Matson from a local hero into one of the most famous Santas in the world. In October of 2016, Eric was contacted by a local nurse who was familiar with his services as a Santa Claus. This nurse would explain that a five-year-old terminally ill child had expressed that they were scared about missing Christmas, and despite their severe sickness, the magic of Christmas still occupied the forefront of the imagination of the young one. The nurse caring for the boy urged Eric to make a visit as Santa, hoping that this gesture could raise the spirits of the young boy in their final moments on planet Earth. According to the story, which has been recounted numerous times by Eric himself, the Santa felt obligated to heed the call. He suited up and headed to the hospital to perform the solemn duty of giving a five-year-old terminally ill boy 
his final Christmas. While no video of this fabled encounter exists, a video showing an emotional testimony given by Eric recounting it does. Apparently, Eric had described the encounter with the terminal five-year-old to some of his close friends in the wake of the hospital visit, which resulted in one of these people reaching out to the local news media. In turn, a news reporter would track down Eric and request a retelling of the tale. A retelling that would cause tears to well up in the eyes of people around the United States. This is that story. Have to start up that jolly voice, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. Since, you know what's this I hear you're going to be missing Christmas this year? Yeah, they tell me I'm dying. Really? Well, you're not going to miss Christmas. Y'all's already had your present already made. We knew you wanted this for a long time. Santa gave the boy a toy and these words. When you get up those pearly gates, you just tell him you're Santa's number one elf. He like... I am. You sure are. They'll let you in for, I'm sure they'll let you right in. He goes, they will? I says, I know it. So he just came up and he gave me a big hug. If the story ended here, Eric's deed would already be remarkable, but it's what he describes next that really brings up the intensity and emotional weight of this encounter up by tenfold. I had a hold of me, he just kind of looked up at me and he says, Santa, can you help me? And that's when he passed. Eric Schmidt Monson's story of a terminally ill child leaving our world after receiving Santa's blessing would go viral online for good reason. This heart wrenching testimony was published to YouTube by two NBC News affiliates on December 12th and December 13th, respectively. This video would go on to receive millions of views in a matter of days, and Eric soon found himself an international celebrity of sorts, with the man's social media inboxes becoming flooded with friend requests, messages, and comments, thanking him for giving the sick child a final Christmas before his passing. Considering the proximity of Christmas to when this story was told, it's no surprise that it became so popular. After all, his deed encapsulated what Christmas is all about, spreading happiness and joy, and doing so to the people who need it the most, the sick and destitute. The tale showcases how a seemingly inconsequential visit by a silly man dressed as Santa Claus can literally be one of the most impactful moments of a child's life, be it instilling a lifelong core memory of holiday happiness, or in this case, providing the momentary peace of mind that this child needed to make the trip to the other side. Thanks to this man, Santa's number one elf got Christmas. That is, of course, if you believe Mr. Eric Schmidt Matson's tale. Which brings us to the second act of this bizarre story, as many online have accused the man of blatantly lying. Considering the general pessimism that one can find online, it should come at no surprise to you that there was a small contingent of individuals on the internet that felt like Eric Schmidt Madsen made up this story in an effort to gain attention and possibly benefit off of it for business purposes. I'm sorry for being emotional, I just, I just can't tell that story without being affected. Eric refuses to reveal the name of the boy or the hospital where the youngster died, and that has some people wondering. These individuals found his story about the terminally ill child too far-fetched to be real. Adding to the contingent of doubters was the Knoxville Sentinel, a publication that had previously written a piece about Eric Schmidt Matson's story. In the days following the viral explosion of his video telling the story, the Sentinel would publish an article about the man, adding on to a previous story that they had written about him. The article was titled, Story of Santa Claus with Dying Child Can't Be Verified. It it reads, Since publication, the new Sentinel has done additional investigation in an attempt to independently verify Schmidt Matson's account. This has proven unsuccessful. Although facts about his background have checked out, his story of bringing a gift to a dying child remains unverified. The new Sentinel cannot establish that Schmidt Matson's account is inaccurate, but more importantly, ongoing reporting cannot establish that it is accurate. Therefore, because the story does not meet the newspaper's standards of verification, we are no longer standing by the veracity of Schmidt Matson's account. So what this article did was basically use a hundred words to say, we don't have any proof that he visited this terminally ill child, but we also don't have any proof that he didn't visit the terminally ill child. 
Really helpful, Knoxville Sentinel. All you really did there was basically just so doubt. While nobody at this point had any proof that Eric was being dishonest, the small ember of scrutiny was burning in the public. I mean, after all, how insane would it be if Eric Schmidt Matzen made up this tale? Essentially invoking the sad image of a five-year-old terminally ill child to make himself look like a hero. Some news outlets smelled blood in the water and rushed to debunk the tale. Some of these would ask Eric to provide proof of his claim. The media wanted Eric to reveal the name of the kid or their family or perhaps the hospital facility that he visited. And they wanted this information naturally so that they could question people involved and sort of, you know, cross-reference the stories. But in regard to these inquiries, Eric would stay tight-lipped, refusing to reveal what he saw as sensitive information. The man not sharing intricate details out of fear of the child's family being harassed. With Eric being pretty Pretty hushed about the matter, some media outlets would go on to call hospitals in the area. One news media outlet claims they called every hospital in East Tennessee. This reporter says that all of these hospitals denied the story taking place at their facility. When this piece of information was presented to Eric, he didn't really seem all too worried about it and stuck to his story. He explains that hospital workers likely have a policy not to talk about it out of respect for the family's privacy and HIPAA. The nurses are afraid of, of an immediate supervisor being vindictive, and they know the hospital won't let, won't allow it from being fired for not following protocol for this issue. Uh, they, they would love to have the, the press, you know, that kind of stuff. They know that. But they also know that you can come up, you can trump up any kind of excuse for getting rid of somebody later on. And um, they're hysterical. They do not want to be identified. Despite there being some scrutiny into Mr. Schmidt-Modson's claim, there was never any proof surfacing that he faked this incident. And in all reality, there's more circumstantial evidence that exists which suggests that he did in fact visit a five-year-old terminally ill child that died on him while he was there. His tellings of the encounter have remained consistent, even prior to him coming out to the public with the story. Eric has been found to have had text messages with friends and relatives recounting the same narrative of events that we're familiar with months prior to talking to any journalist. Eric's wife would even go to the media in light of the backlash in defense of her husband, and the woman gets emotional even talking about it. This is something that weighed so heavy on him that he passed up the chance to be with family, to be with his grandsons that love him dearly, because he obviously wasn't prepared for a child to die in his arms. He's not been trained. And let's just for a second throw all of the things that I've mentioned out of the window. Just look at the video itself of Eric talking about this fabled encounter. Those ain't no crocodile tears, dude. This is genuine emotion from a guy recalling some seriously traumatic and difficult shit. There will always be some skeptics out there when it comes to this story, but I personally believe it to be true. Eric Schmidt Matson continues to work as a Santa Claus actor and spreads joy around East Tennessee every Christmas season. The video showcasing Eric telling his story with the five-year-old terminally ill child has close to 20 million views these days and will forever exist on the internet as a beacon of what Christmas is all about. When one thinks of careers that involve life-saving acts of heroism, pizza delivery driver probably isn't even cutting your top 100 list here. Well, you might want to hold that thought as I introduce you to the story of pizza delivery man, Nick Bostick. 15 seconds, tell me about what injuries did you have? Um, I got a real deep laceration on my forearm, wow. um, blisters. <laughs> a numerous amount of blisters. While Nick was technically off work the night of his heroic deed taking place, the man worked part-time for Papa John's. On this night off, Nick was hanging out with his girlfriend at their apartment, and oddly enough, the series of events that led to Nick Bostick saving a bunch of children from a burning building all begins with him getting into an argument with his girlfriend. 
At approximately 12.30 in the morning on July 11th of 2022, Nick and his girlfriend got in a bit of a spat, a spat which ended up in Nick storming out of the apartment and going for a drive in his pizza delivery car to clear his head. Now let's table Nick's drive for a second and move elsewhere into the city. At another home in Lafayette, Indiana, 18-year-old Siona Barrett was in the process of babysitting her siblings. These kids included a one-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 13 year-old along with another 13 year old who was staying the night at Siona's parents house. Siona's parents David and Tierra Barrett were out on a date night and entrusted Siona with watching over the residents. However this date night would turn into a nightmare for the family as while the parents were gone a fire would start in the home while the kids were asleep. The fire, which wasn't immediately noted by Siona and the kids, quickly took over the house and caught him off guard. And before long, the entire Barrett household was engulfed in flames with all of the children inside. Now, just by happenstance, while Nick was out on his drive letting off steam, he saw some flames in the distance and went to check it out and stumbled upon this burning property with no firefighters present. Instead of passing by the house and expecting firemen to save the day, Nick would park his vehicle and got out to investigate. The man rushing to the flaming home, checking to see if there were any occupants inside. His body coursing with adrenaline, Nick didn't hesitate in his search, charging through the back door and assessing what was going on to see if there was anyone in danger. Nick would enter the house and called out amongst the raging flames to see if he could hear any voices to, you know, to confirm if anyone was there. Initially, the man heard heard no response, and at this point he could have assumed that nobody was inside, but Nick wanted to make sure, so he opted to explore the burning home further. And it's a good thing that he did, as Nick would encounter Siona and three of the kids who were all stricken with fear and panic. He would help Siona and these kids get out of the burning house. When Nick was escorting them out, he would ask Siona if this was everyone. Siona did a quick head check and was mortified to discover that one of the girls was missing. Kehlani, the six-year-old sibling, was nowhere to be found and assumed to have still been inside. Nick would make sure they were safe and the heroic man would venture back into the smoke-filled house in an effort to rescue Kehlani. His second venture inside was far more precarious than the initial. The smoke was thick to the point where Nick had to wrap his shirt around his mouth and it was impossible to see anything so he had to rely on hearing to get around. He listened closely for cries for help and managed to detect some screams from the six-year-old girl who was upstairs in the building. Nick would bravely navigate his way to the second floor of the house and he fortunately was able to locate the girl. However, by the time he had made it up, the smoke was so thick downstairs that he couldn't return the way that he came. In this life or death situation, Nick, thinking quickly, decided to punch out an upstairs window, and he would jump from this second story window with the child in his arms. Fortunately, him and the child only suffered minor injuries from the fall. Nick recounts his leap of faith, quote, We looked out the window and I went shoulders first through it and I landed on my right side with her on my left side. Fire crews and police would arrive around this time and body camera footage from the local firefighters were able to capture the aftermath as they found Nick running to them with the child in his arms. Are you <laughs> Firefighters took Kehlani away as Nick collapsed onto the ground, out of breath and begging for oxygen and water. You're okay, baby. You're okay. Okay, Ty. Here. Raise your arm up for me, man. Really the parents of the family pulled up to the scene around this time as well. Seeing the flames from a distance, they feared the worst had happened. But when they arrived, they found all of their kids safe and alive, and it was all because of Nick Bostick's heroic moves. This part-time Papa John's employee was airlifted to an Indianapolis hospital where he was treated for smoke inhalation and an arm injury, among other wounds. Nick would be discharged several days later. The Barrett property was completely burnt down as a result of the flames, but the family was extremely thankful to Nick because if it wasn't for Nick, they would have lost more than just the house. Nick's rescue of this 
Davis family got a lot of local media attention. In interviews, Nick humbly proclaimed that he wasn't a hero and he would want someone to do the same for him and his family if his house was on fire. The internet would catch wind of this story and they felt like Nick was being a bit too modest, so they started a GoFundMe in support for the guy. The GoFundMe created for Nick Bostick's family to help pay for his medical bills has raised over $600,000 in donations and contributions are still coming in to this very day. In 2023, alongside 15 others, Nick Bostick was given the Carnegie Medal, the highest honor for civilian heroism in the country. The medal has only been awarded to 10,355 individuals since the start of the fund in 1904. Along with this reward, Nick was also given a financial grant by the government. While most think of policemen and firefighters as the guys who get the job done when it comes to rescue scenarios, you can never underestimate the heroism capable of a Papa John's employee. I think a common trope when it comes to unlikely heroes is just an average guy being at the right place at the right time. This next story involves an individual who was minding his own business riding his bike home on the way back from McDonald's. And well, believe it or not, this McDonald's trip inadvertently resulted in this man saving three kidnapped girls, putting one of Cleveland's most notorious kidnappers behind bars, and making the McDonald's visitor a international hero and viral internet meme in the process. This is the story of Charles Ramsey and the dead giveaway incident. What was the reaction on the girls' faces? I can't imagine to see the sunlight to be around Bro, I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms. Something is wrong here. Dead giveaway. Dead Charles, giveaway. Charles, thank you very Dead much. Dead giveaway. Thank you very much for your time. And Either she homeless or she got problems. That's the only reason why she run to a black man. To begin this tale, let's introduce its monstrous antagonist, a detestable man by the name of Ariel Castro. Within a span of two years, from 2002 to 2004, Cleveland resident Ariel Castro was responsible for the kidnapping of three girls in the Cleveland area. Castro's first victim was 21-year-old Michelle Knight, taken in August of 2002. His second victim was 16-year-old Amanda Berry, taken April 21st of 2003. Castro's last victim was Gina de Jesus, taken in April of 2004. The girl was only 14 years old at the time. Despite these girls all disappearing relatively close to Ariel Castro's residence at 2207 Seymour Avenue, the man was never considered a kidnapping suspect by police. Little did authorities know, Castro had been holding all three of these girls captive in his house of horrors and subjecting them to frequent bouts of unspeakable sex sexual abuse. Over the period of years that Castro had kidnapped these girls, Michelle Knight was allegedly impregnated five times. It's said that each time he discovered the girl was pregnant, he would induce miscarriages through beatings involving hitting her with dumbbells, punching her, and slamming her against walls. Amanda Berry was also impregnated at one point and actually gave birth to a child on Christmas Day of 2006. Castro would keep all of his despicable crimes a complete secret. Despite having these women kidnapped in his house for years, he appeared somewhat normal to the neighbors around him, often going to cookouts and chatting up with passerbys on the street when the opportunity presented itself. As a result of this air of conspicuousness surrounding the man, Ariel Castro was able to abuse these women in his home for a period of 10 years. But on May 6th of 2013, Ariel Castro's abuse would come to an end, and it was all due to a chance encounter with Amanda Berry and a man named Charles Ramsey. Charles Ramsey, a Cleveland native, was a neighbor of Ariel Castro at this time. Ramsey had somewhat of a relationship with the man, the extent of which involved the two meeting at cookouts from time to time, and them keeping an eye out on each other's properties for potential home invaders. Now speaking of cookouts, ironically, it would be a cheeseburger that led to Charles Ramsey discovering the dark secret that his neighbor was keeping. 
On May 6th of 2013, Charles Ramsey, apparently suffering from a Big Mac craving, would get on his bicycle and head to the nearby McDonald's at around 3 p.m. On his way to the restaurant, Charles would observe Ariel Castro checking his mail. He acknowledged the man and continued on his McDonald's journey. A short time later, Ramsey would return with his Big Mac spread and he went inside of his house and chowed down. While Charles Ramsey was in the middle of his McDonald's run, Ariel Castro had left his property. Property. However, this wasn't unusual for Ariel. He would frequently leave the house with the girls inside to run errands, and he kept them in with an elaborate system of locks and multiple doors, so there really wasn't any opportunity for them to get out when this lock system was in place. However, on this day, Amanda Berry would catch Ariel Castro slipping. Mr. Castro had mistakenly left the heavy front door of the home unlocked leaving only a thin metal exterior screen door between the girls and escape. Out of the three girls, Amanda was often allowed to roam around the house freely without chains because she had to care for her baby, and this freedom proved to be invaluable in this moment. Seeing this opportunity for freedom, Amanda ran to the door and began yelling out of it for help. Her loud cries rang out through the neighborhood, catching the attention of two neighbors in the close vicinity, these neighbors being Angel Cordero and Charles Ramsey. Cordero was the first to have heard the screams, and he rushed to the door. The the man didn't speak any English, but knew that the girl inside was asking for help. Moments later, Charles Ramsey rushed to the scene with a Big Mac in one of his hands. They pried open the bottom of the lock screen door just enough to where Amanda could sneak outside. Whenever she weaseled her way out of the small hole, she ran into Charles's arms and told her that her name was Amanda Berry and that there were other girls inside of the home. Amanda explained that she was a kidnapping victim and needed him to call the police. Charles completely stopped at what was happening would escort Amanda out of the house and give her a cell phone so that she could call 911. This phone call has since been made public. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and I'm, I'm here, I'm free now. Okay, and what's your address? Uh, 2207 Seymour Avenue. 2207 Seymour, it looks like you're calling me from 2210. Okay, stay there with those neighbors, talk to the police when they get there. Okay. Uh, hello? Yeah, talk to the police when they get there. Okay, I'm on the way right now. I need We're going to send them as soon as we get a car open. No, I need them now before we get them back. All right, we're sending them, okay? Okay, I mean, like, who's, right the guy, who's the guy you're, uh, trying, who's the guy who went out? Um, his name is Ariel Castro. After receiving these 911 calls, police, who were in complete disbelief, pulled up to the scene and couldn't believe what they were witnessing. Cleveland's most wanted missing girls had been found, and it was all thanks to Charles and Angel. All three women, plus the child, were taken into a medical center to receive care. Ariel Castro would be arrested shortly after at a nearby McDonald's parking lot and charged with four counts of kidnapping and three counts of rape. What followed this bizarre discovery and arrest was news crews swarming to the scene. And uh, the result of this is a now famous news interview involving Charles himself. Charles was already going to be a Cleveland hero for his help in rescuing Amanda and the other girls. But the charisma showed in this news interview would make sure that he was an international online hero as well. Hey, Charles, Charles, let me talk to you. I'm talking with Charles Ramsey. He's a neighbor. Uh, t walk me through again what happened this afternoon. You, were, you, you heard screaming. I heard screaming. I'm eating my McDonald's. I uh, come outside. I see this girl going nuts trying to get out of her house. So we kick the bottom. And she comes out with the little girl. And she says, call 911. My name was Amanda Berry. Despite the serious nature of the day's events, Charles still manages to make everyone laugh. His most famous line, of course, being, I knew something was wrong as soon as a pretty little white girl ran into a black man's arms. Dead giveaway. What was the reaction on the girl's faces? I can't imagine to see the sunlight to be Bro, around people. I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms. Something is wrong here. Dead giveaway. Dead Charles, giveaway. Charles, thank you very Dead much. Dead giveaway. Thank you very much for your time. And Either she homeless or she got problems. That's the only reason why she runs to a black man.
With the girls rescued thanks to the help of Charles and Ariel now facing life in prison, there was indeed much to celebrate. Internet memes were made in honor of Charles, music remixes Schmo Yoho style were all over the place. Yeah, give away. And for about a week, Charles was literally the most famous man in America. The Big Mac wielding rescuer of Amanda Berry and the other girls would appear on several different news shows in the days and weeks following the incident, with themes of humility and charm shining through with each appearance. Charles was also thanked by McDonald's, who received quite a bit of free publicity during this entire affair. McDonald's would thank Charles for inadvertently promoting their Big Mac in his interview, rewarding him with 20 $100 gift cards. However, Charles, the class act that he was, would go on to give these gift cards to homeless people. Another incident that speaks to Charles' selfless nature is a report that claims the man was offered reward money by the public for helping with the rescue. But Charles, who worked as a short order cook at the time, denied this money, saying, quote, I have a job, give it to the girls instead. While Charles was busy becoming an internet meme and Cleveland legend, Ariel Castro was made to face justice for his crimes. Ariel Castro was facing a total of 977 criminal counts, which consisted of 512 counts of kidnapping, 446 counts of rape, 7 counts of gross imposition, 6 counts of felonious assault, 3 counts of child endangerment, 2 counts of aggravated murder, and 1 count of possession of criminal tools. On July 26, 2013, Ariel Castro would plead guilty to 937 of the 977 charges pressed against him as a part of a plea deal. And in August 1st of 2013, he was sentenced to serve consecutive life terms in prison with an additional 1,000 years without any possibility of parole. One month into his life sentence on September 3rd of 2013, the absolute piece of garbage filth that was Ariel Castro would be found dead within his cell, hanging from a bedsheet. The coward was 53 years old at the time of his death. Ariel Castro's house of horrors, where all the unsettling crimes took place, no longer exists today. It was demolished soon after the man was arrested. The three survivors, Amanda Berry, Michelle Knight, and Georgina de Jesus, are doing well currently. Michelle Knight now goes by the name Lily Rose Lee and works in helping animals in need. Georgina now uses her experience to help with others who are suffering from abuse. And Amanda Berry has worked on occasion with Fox 8 News as a host for their missing persons segment in a way to help bring back those in her city that were kidnapped just as she was. The online fanfare surrounding Charles Ramsey has died down in recent years and that's probably for the better as the man eventually, you know, needs to have some peace in his life. And of course, you know, he needs to move on from this incident. Charles and Amanda Berry would reunite and reflect on this event back in 2019. In this meeting, Amanda expressed how much she appreciated Charles for what he did. Charles, however, insists that she was the real hero. The conversation is truly a beautiful moment. I was finally face to face with the man I remember seeing through that broken door, my personal hero. So when they say, dude, you a hero, man, good, good looking. Now. I say, man, you need to shut up. Really? And realize who the hero is. The but hero is that girl that got taken from her family and still fought and give up. Right. She reversed the game. So this is how it's gonna be. Fine, I can deal with this because I know God gonna come get me sooner or later. So so I'll play the game you it which was smart. That was smart as hell what you did. Then I don't care how many years it took. You knew how to play it. That's what makes you the hero. Interestingly, Nick Bostic isn't the only pizza delivery driver that the internet has fallen in love with thanks to a unlikely hero situation. Allow me to introduce you to Tyler Morrill, a man who stopped an at-large fugitive. While out on a pizza delivery in April of 2023, Philadelphia man Tyler Morrill was approaching a customer's door prepared to deliver a couple of pies from Coco's Pizza that he was holding. When all of a sudden, a high-speed chase that had been occurring in the Middleton Township descends upon the neighborhood that he's delivering these pies in. 
this chase ending right next to the house that he was walking up to. Video footage captured the moment a stolen Kia driven by the perpetrator sped by the house. The Kia would spin out and crash in the front yard across the street from the property. The erratic driver even comes close to hitting Tyler's vehicle and you can hear him muttering something in the video like, bro, they, sh they better not hit my fucking car. That's a high speed chase. Police would box the perpetrator's vehicle in somewhere off camera here, and it's at this point that the guy goes on foot trying to escape law enforcement. But unfortunately for this criminal, Tyler was there to put an end to all of these shenanigans. No! no. As the suspect was running past Tyler on foot, he stuck his leg out, tripped the perpetrator, allowing officers to swarm in and arrest him. While many would stay out of the way in a situation like this, Tyler said he was just sick of crime in the area. Quote, I'm so sick of seeing crime go on, especially half a mile down the road. So if they needed a hand or foot, I was there. I started walking towards the road, but I couldn't do anything with my hands because I'm holding the pizza. So I just stuck my leg out. The individual that ordered the pizza Danielle Yeager had this to say about their driver knocking out a suspect and still giving them hot pies. Quote, 10 out of 10 delivery, unquote. The suspect that was dropped by Tyler is a juvenile and their name is not public information. They were arrested as well as the 19 year old passenger of the vehicle that stayed inside when the driver exited and ran on foot. The doorbell footage showcasing this incident went viral online and Tyler was heralded as a hero by the greater internet. It's a good thing he went down like a domino. You better not hit my fuck car dude didn't even drop the pizza our next internet hero is a blue collar cctv camera technician credited for catching a mass shooting suspect this is the story of Zach Tahan and the capture of Frank James. On April 12th of 2022, a man named Frank James boarded the northbound N train on the New York City subway in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Frank James was 62 years old at the time and was somewhat infamous online due to extremist postings that he had published to the internet. The man would often post hateful and angry rants on social media containing anti-Semitic diatribes and racist comments. But and then they forget my name. They forget my name. This is the Prophet Truth channel. This is Prophet Truth channel, but I am the Prophet of Doom. That's my original name, the Prophet of Doom. That's what I'm calling myself something on YouTube. What do you think that, what do you think that's a, <laughs> so what do you want from me? We're about to be, Doomsday is actually about to be here. We're actually about to experience Doomsday. James also had a criminal track record that went back to the 90s. He had been arrested nine times in New York and three times in New Jersey. That being said though, none of the crimes committed by Frank James were felonies, so he was able to purchase firearms. And unfortunately, this man who had violent online beliefs, they converted to the real world and he had plans for some firearms that he had bought. While on the end train at 8.24 AM, Frank pulled out his gun and fired multiple shots into a crowd of passengers. He then put on a gas mask and threw out multiple smoke grenades as he fired more rounds into the crowd. In total, Frank James fired 33 shots and then fled the scene before he could be caught. There were a total of 29 injuries reported, 10 from gunfire and 19 from other injuries, including smoke inhalation. Fortunately though, there were no casualties during this initial attack. While thankfully no one had died, the problem was is that Frank James was now an at-large shooter who had managed to disappear into the crowds of New York and nobody knew where he was. So the thought was it was only a matter of time before he was going to attack again at another crowded location and potentially kill people. Unfortunately, none of the cameras in the subway were able to capture Frank James in the act as there was some sort of connection issue with the cameras. The subway system in New York has 10,000 cameras associated with it. And apparently on this day, out of these 10,000 cameras, these three just happened not to 
have been working. What are the fucking odds of that? Initially at a loss for who the suspect could possibly be, one bystander did manage to capture footage on a cell phone that gave authorities a rough image of Frank to go off of. But with the pretty shoddy image to go off of, it was like finding a needle in a haystack. With the would-be killer at large, police would set up a tip line and encouraged anyone who may have information about the subway shooter to call them. Many would submit tips to this line, all of them being fruitless. Curiously though, the day after the attack, a man believed to have been Frank himself allegedly called the tip line and said he would surrender at a McDonald's located in East Village. This call said, quote, you know I think you're looking for me. I'm seeing my picture all over the news. I'll be around this McDonald's. If this really was Frank, it almost seemed like he was toying with police. They would later visit this McDonald's and found no individual matching his description on the premises or nearby it. The cops were at a loss for where this guy could have been. But that's where Zak Tahan enters the story. Zak Tahan, a 21-year-old Syrian immigrant and New Jersey resident, worked as an installer of security video cameras. Zak had been deeply disturbed by the events that took place in the subway as it was partly his job to maintain these cameras. He felt like he was personally responsible in a way for the guy getting, you know, out of dodge after committing his crime. So Zach kind of took this guy's slights against the public personally, and he wanted to do something about it and potentially aid in the capture of this man. Zach was also intrigued by the fact that the shooter mentioned that he was going to be visiting an East Village McDonald's. As on the day of police investigating this tip, Zach was tasked with installing security cameras at an East Village hardware store. As I mentioned previously, police couldn't find him when they looked around the McDonald's in East Village. However, Zach had eyes all over the place. While investigating his cameras set up in the East Village, Zach spotted an individual that matched the description showcased in the rough quality cell phone video that was revealed to the public. He was confident that he had eyes on the subway shooter, so he flagged down police and would point out the guy in the crowd. The man was making a big public scene trying to get the attention of law enforcement as he's like, yo, pointing at this is the dude, this is the guy, you gotta arrest him. People thought he was crazy at first, but as police came up, they realized they had found their guy. Zach had literally identified this dude in a crowd of people thanks to his security cameras. Moments later, Frank James was captured and arrested at the corner of St. Mark's Place and First Avenue by police without incident. Following this miraculous identification, Zach would provide a press appearance to the media in which he gave his point of view on the matter and how he was able to find the guy. When I see that seven people die, I just, I was, I cannot breathe. Like, I was, can, I cannot sleep too. Like, I, I was, I don't like to, I don't like the life. Like, try to, I want to try to work, I cannot because this guy, he put me in trouble. Like, when he see that seven people kill, maybe just seven people have kids, maybe have family, maybe something like that. Like, and I see him, he have bag in his uh, bag and he was walking the sidewalk and he put the bag in the street like this and I see the people, guys, please, the people was walking behind him. I told him, guys, keep far from him. Please, this guy is gonna do something. Like this, people think I am crazy. Like nobody tries to believe me. Like I told him, guys, trust me, this guy, this is the guy. It was an energetic and inspiring story, a working class hero successfully thwarting an at-large would-be killer. Zach would become a hero online, especially on Twitter, with hashtag thank you Zach trending across the website. His commitment to capturing the subway shooter would be covered by many outlets such as The Daily Show and CNN. Following all the fanfare, Zach was given the Good Samaritan Award and would also be later granted a key to the city. I love this story because it tells the tale of just a blue collar everyman guy doing his job as a citizen and really coming to the rescue and accomplishing something great in the process. So shout out to Zach. Old timers are often underestimated and even sometimes taken advantage of and targeted by criminals. These thugs believing that older people are easy targets for robberies. However, this couldn't be further from the truth, at least in the case of Samuel Williams, the internet cafe gunslinger responsible for saving an entire building of innocent people. 
On July 13th of 2012, within Palm's Internet Cafe, 71-year-old Sam Williams was spending some time with his wife, seated in the corner minding their own business, when all of a sudden two 19-year-old men, David G. Dawkins and Duane Henderson, invaded the cafe with a handgun and a baseball bat. Obviously, their goal was to rob the joint. When they busted in, they told everybody not to move and hand over their valuables. To prove they meant business, Dawkins smashed some of the glass computer screens in the building with his baseball bat, some of this glass flying and injuring people inside. It's thought that these guys may have even been willing to kill to get what they wanted, but little did they know they had a bona fide badass sitting at one of the tables here. Mr. Samuel Williams had no intentions of letting these teenagers rob him or anyone in the establishment. As a matter of fact, old Sammy had a surprise for these kids. Surveillance video shows that as the two men were making their move to rob someone inside, Samuel simply stood up from his chair, pulled out his 380 handgun, and began blasting at the thugs. Sam's volley of lead sent the two bumbling criminals beelining towards the door. Sammy fired a few more rounds at him as they fell over each other trying to get outside. The 71-year-old man followed him out and chased them down the street. Several hours later, both Dawkins and Henderson were arrested by police. Samuel Williams was credited for their capture. Thankfully, the man wasn't charged with any bogus crimes as his actions were seen as self-defense. As a result of Samuel's shootings, Dawkins suffered a bullet wound to his arm and chest. Henderson was also shot, but his injuries weren't as severe. Both of the men would survive. In April of 2023, Dawkins was sentenced to serve four years in prison and ordered to pay restitution. Henderson would accept a plea deal in July of 2013 and was sentenced on two concurrent five-year stays in prison. Samuel Williams, the internet cafe gunslinger, didn't take any interviews following the shooting. Needless to say, his act went viral online and the guy became a viral legend of sorts. For all the ne'er-do-wells out there, be careful where you choose to rob and don't underestimate the senior citizens of America as you just might get blasted. Our next Unlikely Heroes story is a special one for me personally, as the incident that I'm about to describe to you took place literally 30 minutes from where I live. It's the story of James Shaw, a man who was eating Waffle House after a night of clubbing and inadvertently stopped a mass shooter. James Shaw Jr. was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee and graduated from Tennessee State University. As a boy, James was interested in the world of electronics, eventually becoming an AT&T wire technician. James Shaw is a blue collar Nashville type of guy, a dude that just gets his job done, works hard, and when he has some off time, he likes to do a little partying, clubbing, you name it. But what was a routine for James ultimately led him being in a situation where life or death was the outcome. As in April of 2018, James came face to face with a mass shooter within a Waffle House in Antioch, Tennessee. The shooter being Travis Reinking. Travis Reinking, who at the time of this story taking place, was in his late 20s. He was a man that had been battling mental illness for most of his adult life. Travis was a man who suffered from severe schizophrenia and often heard voices. He had a long history of run-ins with law enforcement, thanks to behaviors that were fueled by delusions. In the early morning hours of April 22nd of 2018, Ryan King's brain, riddled with paranoia, led him to make the decision to do something beyond redemption, and that was to enter a Waffle House armed with an AR-15 style rifle. Ryan King sat out in the parking lot inside of his pickup truck for some time before he entered the building. Once Travis got out of the pickup truck, it was revealed he was only wearing a green jacket and nothing else. Within the parking lot, he fatally shot two people, and then he went inside the Waffle House, unleashing an onslaught of bullets to the patrons inside. James Shaw was inside of the Waffle House eating his food when Travis busted in and started shooting, and he decided to do something about it. As Travis Ryan King stopped to reload his AR-15, James Shaw rushed the man, slamming him into the door of the building. He 
He was then able to wrestle the AR away from the deranged man. Shaw's hand was burnt by the barrel of the gun while he attempted to pry it away from the man. The two wrestled for some time outside until Travis finally broke free and started running completely naked. For the time being, he was a wanted man considered dangerous, but his attack on the Waffle House had been thwarted, though there was some human cost. In total, Travis Reinking's assault resulted in four fatalities. 23-year-old Aquila Da Silva, 21-year-old De Ebroni Groves, 29-year-old Tareen Sonderlin, and 20-year-old Joe Perez. It's important to note that Travis Reinking was tackled and subdued by James Shaw as he was reloading. If it wasn't for James's intervention, there would have most certainly been more killed. James was a hero. Travis Reinking would later be captured by police about 34 hours after his initial shooting. He was spotted by a construction worker who reported him entering a wooded area close to the Waffle House. This was a massive story around Nashville when it took place. I think the international media covered it to some extent. Some of you might be familiar with this, but you know, James was a hero. Shaw would later be given a standing ovation by Tennessee lawmakers and the public would raise $227,000 for him on GoFundMe to pay for injuries that he suffered when he was fighting Travis Reinking. Tennessee State University, where James went to school, would also set up a scholarship fund in Shaw's name. He was applauded and awarded for his quick decision making and appeared on many programs including the Ellen DeGeneres Show and he was awarded the Special Courage Award from the United States Department of Justice in April of 2019. The man would also receive a BET Humanitarian Award. Travis Reinking was later charged with four counts of criminal homicide but was found incompetent to stand trial. The man remained incompetent until October of 2018. Ryan King was later found guilty on all counts on February 4th of 2022, and he was sentenced to serve life in prison without any chance of parole. Our next offbeat viral internet hero is a man that spent much of his extracurricular time in a Batman suit. Known by some as the Route 29 Batman, this individual rose to online fame after a dashcam video showcasing him masquerading around town went viral online. Some of you may be familiar with this video, but what you might not be aware of is the laundry list of charitable deeds that this man is responsible for. This is the story of the Route 29 Batman, his deeds, and his extremely tragic death. This is Baltimore, Maryland man Lenny B. Robinson. Before becoming the Route 29 Batman, Lenny B. Robinson was a successful businessman. When he was just a teenager, he formed his own commercial cleaning company, and over time this venture would make him a wealthy man. Lenny would eventually go on to sell this cleaning business, allowing him to retire in his 40s. And one might expect a man in this position to go on to live some sort of lavish bachelor lifestyle, but Lenny took the complete opposite route. Lenny would become a family man and also would dedicate his time and money to philanthropy, charity, and enriching his local community. Lenny would go on to have three sons and it's thanks to one of his sons that Lenny inadvertently discovered his purpose as a Batman impersonator. One of his boys was said to have had something of an obsession with Batman. So in an effort to make his boys happy, at one point Lenny spent $5,000 to have a custom Batman suit created for himself. One day, Lenny would come home and surprise his boys with this elaborate suit, and their reaction was priceless. Seeing the reaction that his own kids gave to this Batman suit, Lenny would make it somewhat of a habit to go out in public wearing it while he's with his kids just to see if he could get a reaction of other children and other people in the community. Everywhere Lenny went in this Batman suit, he spread happiness and joy, just good vibes all over the place. Lenny would make a habit out of masquerading as Batman, and before you know it, the man had stumbled into a new purpose in his retirement. His newfound purpose in life was to essentially become Batman and spread smiles around the Baltimore community. With newfound purpose, Lenny began enhancing his Batman persona, even going as far as creating his own bat cave in his house and purchasing a custom Batman-themed Lamborghini. Lenny was often seen driving around in this vehicle on Route 29 near Baltimore, leading to him getting the nickname the Route 29 Batman. Mr. Robinson would often make free public appearances in 
Santa's get up for the amusement of children and adults around town, the man slowly becoming a folk hero of sorts in the city. And while Lenny was certainly beloved in his local community, his reputation would spread around the country after a police dash cam video showing uh, police pulling him over in his Batmobile would go viral on the internet. This humorous video shows that even police officers have difficulty containing their excitement in the presence of the Baltimore Batman. You mind if I take a picture, brother? Not at all. Immediately, the questions began. Who is the guy behind this mask? During this dash cam interaction, Lenny tells the police that he was on his way to a local children's hospital. Which brings us to the most important element of Lenny B. Robinson's charitable contributions to society. Visiting children's hospitals would become Lenny's most solemn duty. Lenny knew that the sick and ill children of these facilities are the ones that needed him the most. Dressed as the iconic hero, Lenny was permitted to make many unannounced visits to certain child patients at these care centers. These unexpected visits boosting the spirits of the children dealing with some of the most depressing struggles imaginable. His self-stated mission at the time has been described as this, to entertain ill and terminally ill children by appearing to them as Batman and teaching them that just as Batman fights battles, no matter how hard or how long their health battles may be, with strength of will and determination, there is always hope. That's really touching, man. Like, like seriously. Now, after becoming a viral sensation thanks to that police dash cam footage, Lenny's ability to help these sick and ill children was expanded to a vast degree, as now he had hospitals around the country asking him to make visits. The Route 29 Batman had become a legendary figure in the United States and was a beacon of hope in a sea of negative headlines one encountered on a daily basis. But tragically, this charity work no longer continues because Lenny B. Robinson's life would sadly be ended after a unexpected catastrophe. Lenny B. Robinson's public service to humanity would end on August 16th of 2015. As Lenny was driving his Batmobile home from a weekend festival in South Charleston, West Virginia, he experienced mechanical trouble with the vehicle on Highway 70 near Hagerstown, Maryland. Lenny was forced to immediately pull his vehicle over, parking it on the left shoulder of the highway near the median. Lenny would pop the hood of his Batmobile and went to the front of the vehicle to check the engine. Any of you watching that have ever had car trouble on a highway know just how dangerous this is, and keep in mind it's nighttime. Sadly, at around 10.30 p.m., a Toyota Camry slammed into the back of the Batmobile, propelling the vehicle forward, crushing Lenny in the process. Lenny would die at the scene of the crash. News of the Route 24 Batman's death spread almost instantly. Family, friends, and many others who had known Lenny were distraught with grief when they found out about his passing. His brother said, quote, He was my brother, my business partner, my friend. He touched a lot of lives and made a lot of kids smile. That's all he wanted to do. Many Maryland natives reached out with their condolences to the family, including Baltimore Ravens veteran linebacker Ray Lewis. Quote, the world lost a special spirit, a true living angel. Lenny Robinson will always remain in my heart. Hashtag Baltimore Batman. DC Comics tweeted the following. Our thoughts are with the family and friends of Lenny Robinson, AKA Route 29 Batman, who shared his love of Batman with everyone around him. Lenny's funeral was held on August 19th of 2015. Hundreds would attend the service in an effort to celebrate the selfless man. At Lenny's funeral, a Dark Knight insignia was placed over his casket. While Lenny is no longer with us, his charitable deeds and philanthropy will live on and he will remain a legend. A larger-than-life figure that made children's lives better, that was the story of Lenny B. Robinson, the Route 29 Batman. The fact that most of you watching are unfamiliar with the man that I'm about to discuss is an injustice. This is the story of a man from Sao Paulo, Brazil, Francisco Erasmo Rodriguez, a homeless man that sacrificed his own life to save a woman taken hostage. To begin, I must highlight that Francisco faced a life of struggle. When Francisco was just a baby, his birth parents abandoned him. He was raised as a foster child and had a tumultuous adulthood as well. 
As an adult, he would get a wife and have four children. And him getting married and having these kids was probably the highlight of the man's life, but this period of positivity only lasts for so long as tragedy would strike. In 2006, Francisco's 18-year-old boy was murdered after the boy got into a fight with another individual after an amateur soccer game. Francisco would blame himself for the death of his son. The incident sent the man into a deep depression, and he turned to alcohol to cope with this, and eventually he would become a full-blown alcoholic and his life began to fall apart. Around this time, Francisco has been described as a bitter and angry drunk, and alcoholism would eventually lead to him and his wife getting a divorce and his family turning on him. As a result of this family fallout, Francisco became homeless, and for about the next decade, the man would live on the streets, full of regret and lacking purpose. Francisco wished he could have done things different. He wished he could go back in time and have been there whenever his son got into that fight that led to him getting killed. He felt that he failed as a father. He should have been able to intervene and stop what happened from happening. And as a homeless man on the streets, his family now fallen apart, his life in shambles, he felt like a worthless individual. But what we find is that the universe works in mysterious ways, always giving people second chances. As when Francisco is here at rock bottom, roaming the streets of Sao Paulo, he would be given an opportunity to redeem himself, at least doing what he thought that he needed to do to have value as a person. On September 5th, 2015, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, a man by the name of Luiz Antonio de Silva entered the Sao Paulo Cathedral. Luiz was a known criminal with a rap sheet dating back to 1987, the man previously serving time for attempted murder and drug trafficking. Luiz also had a tendency to harass the homeless and those around the church, carrying with him a screwdriver that he would use to poke them while they were sleeping. On this day, one of the clerks working at the cathedral Eleniza Mariana was in the midst of praying when Louise approached her from behind. The deranged man, you know, coming up on her and provoking her, well, this resulted in an argument between the two. After a short bit of quarreling, Eleniza would walk away in an attempt to leave the interaction and the cathedral itself. But as she was walking out of the cathedral, Mr. Silva followed her, and as she got outside, the man strikes her from behind, grabs her, and takes her hostage. Local officers observed the incident and quickly approached Silva to detain him, but as he saw cops coming towards him, Silva pulled out a pistol from his waistband and held it up to the woman. A hostage situation had broken out on the steps of this hallowed building. It was a dire situation to say the least, one that looked like it was going to end in a deranged psychopath killing a completely innocent woman. But then Francisco enters the picture. Yes, there was a man just outside of the cathedral as all of this dramatic spectacle had began unfolding. And that man was our homeless friend, Francisco Erasmo Rodriguez. Now there's a video recording on YouTube that you can watch showcasing this entire interaction, but it's age restricted and I can't show it here. So I'll do my best to describe the heroic action that this man takes. As Silva takes his hostage to the ground, it looks as if he's about to kill the woman. But Francisco wasn't going to live with the regret of allowing a second innocent individual in his life be killed. He sprung into action. On the cathedral steps, with a cigarette in his mouth, Francisco heroically flanks Silva's position and charges the unhinged assailant, briefly knocking the man off of the hostage and allowing her to flee the steps and get the hell out of there. And this separation gave police the opportunity to fire shots at Silva. Silva is shot multiple times by officers. However, tragically, during the interaction, Silva managed to fire a shot into Francisco's chest. Francisco was also hit by crossfire fire from police bullets. As Silva lay bloodied and dying in the corner of the cathedral steps, Francisco stood triumphantly over him, blood squirting out of his chest as he's doing so. Despite him losing blood rapidly, the video footage of this incident shows Francisco in a rather calm state. Perhaps in that moment, Francisco finally found peace within himself again. He proved himself by protecting the innocent something that he beat himself up over all those years. But like Louise, Francisco would soon begin to fade himself. And shortly after this momentary pause, the homeless rescuer would die outside of the cathedral, collapsing on its steps. Francisco sacrificed himself to save another. 
Thanks to this incident being recorded, it would become quite the spectacle in the Brazilian news circuits. Personally though, my issue with the reporting around this incredible story is that Francisco was often referred to by these outlets simply as a homeless man, you know, the homeless man that saved someone's life. They didn't give him the credit I think he deserves. Name the guy. Usually it's not the kid saving the day. Well, this unlikely viral internet hero was a child that stopped an out of control school bus saving lives in the process. This story takes place on the afternoon of April 26th of 2023 in Warren, Michigan. It was the end of a school day for Dylan Reeves and his fellow Lewis E. Carter middle school students. Dylan and the rest had boarded the bus and were excited to get home. And at first everything seemed like a routine bus ride, a normal commute. However, a short while into this bus trip, the driver of bus 46 appeared to have been having some medical issues. It said that the bus driver began to experience a feeling of dizziness and lightheadedness. CCTV footage has captured the incident. Realizing that she was having issues, she did her best to radio the transportation hub telling them that, hey, she was gonna have to pull over and that she needed help. But unfortunately, these symptoms got acutely worse and she was no longer able to drive. And the footage captures all of it. Before the woman could pull over, she seemingly loses consciousness and the bus began to veer into oncoming traffic. Some children began to notice what was happening and many of them panicked, but not Dylan Reeves. See, Dylan had been riding this bus for some time and Dylan had an interest in motor vehicles riding four wheelers at home. When he rode the bus, he often observed the operator and what they did to keep the bus going. The boy intently observing the acceleration and brake pedals and the steering column, familiarizing himself with the controls of the bus for no other reason than his own amusement. So whenever these kids had realized that the bus driver had passed out, instead of panicking, Dylan gives it a shot and runs up there and attempts to get this bus to safety using the skills he had picked up. Video footage shows as the bus driver's head falls back from passing out, Dylan grabs the wheel of the bus and ever so gently presses on the brake, slowly bringing the vehicle to a halt. And not only is he able to stop the bus, he's able to turn around, get everybody calmed down, and tell someone to call 911. The kid knew his stuff. When police arrived, they were completely flabbergasted to find that a child had stopped this careening bus. Police had to hide their shock for the moment though, as the bus driver had apparently suffered a stroke and needed immediate medical attention. All of the children inside of the bus were transported to another vehicle and taken home safely. Thankfully, the bus driver would eventually make a full recovery. Now, Dylan was certainly a hero in his local community, but when footage of this incident was published online, he became an international hero and for good reason. I gotta be honest with you guys, this would not have been me if I was in this kid's position. He's got a good head on him and he's going places in this world. As a result of his actions, the mayor of Warren, Michigan would award Dylan Reeves with a mayoral proclamation and a key to the city. Dylan is the youngest person from Warren, Michigan to receive this award. The school district, the governor's office, and state senator Paul Wanyo also gave Dylan multiple awards for his bravery. Apparently, when it comes to unlikely heroes, you can't count a kid out. That was the story of Dylan Reeves. And well, you've made it to the end. Let me know what you guys thought about this video down below in the comments section and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.